Hello there and welcome once again to The Verdict. I'm Mick Cornett along with Kent Myers. We're here every week meeting interesting people and dealing with topical issues. And today we're going to get a primer on the GRDA. Yes, uh, we've heard about the GRDA, those of us that have lived in Oklahoma any length of time, virtually all of our lives. And uh, we're now going to find out what it is, what mm -hmm. it does, and why. The Grand River Dam Authority. Mm -hmm. That they have their tentacles in a lot of different things that pertain to you and your life as an Oklahoman. Dan Sullivan's our guest. He'll be here when we return on The Verdict. One of the reasons why I moved to Rockaway is because it's such a diverse culture and different ethnicities. And my camera has opened some doors to really meet people that I probably wouldn't have gotten to meet without it. I'm Beth Perkins, I'm a professional photographer, and I'm Chickasaw. It came in as like a mini tidal wave. Everything sustainable was had just disappeared in one swoop, and I just underestimated this power and I realized really how little we are in this whole scheme of things and how quickly things can go bad. My community is still rebuilding. And for them to just show up out of the blue and just start clearing out my house was, I don't, I'm not one that likes to ask for help. <laughs> so um, for someone to come and do that for me was, it was really touching and humbling. I've thought about the history of the Chicksaws and what they went through as far as relocating and losing their homes and having to rebuild and to thrive in the end after all of that is just a true testament to the Chicksaw strength. And I try and draw from that and remember that that's a part of who I am. See more stories about the Chickasaw people at ProfilesOfANation.com. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. Kent's going to introduce today's guest. We're very pleased today to have on the set of The Verdict uh, Dan Sullivan, the uh, Chief Executive Officer and Director of Investments for the Grand River Dam Authority. He was kind enough to drive down from the eastern part of the state to join us and tell us about the GRDA. Uh, he did his undergraduate work at Northeastern State University at Tahlequah, did his law work at the University of Tulsa uh, College of Law. He was a member of the uh, Oklahoma House of Representatives for uh, seven years. He then engaged in private law practice for a number of years and uh, very, re well, fairly recently he has been uh, designated as CEO of the GRDA. This is our first opportunity to get him on the show, and we're really pleased wow. you'd uh, come this way and uh, join us and tell our viewers about what you do. Thank you. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, yeah. Let's start at the beginning. What is the Grand River Dam Authority? When did it begin, and why was it formed? Sure. It was uh, formed by the Oklahoma Legislature in 1935, uh, and it was a vision of several people in northeast Oklahoma to dam the Grand River to create a lake. Uh, there was then uh, commitments made by the federal government under the Federal, federal Power Act uh, to build and construct a dam that was completed in 1940. So since that time we've had hydroelectric power. It's about 125 megawatts that comes out of that facility. And at the time people thought, what are you going to do with all that power? <laughs> Uh, and it's like a, like there was a surplus. That's right. It yeah. seemed like a great amount. Like, what are you going to do with all those? Well, and that's not a heavily populated area in the immediate vicinity. No, it was not. And yeah. as we all learned in school, it, part of the rural electrification project that was going on with the Roosevelt administration was part of the driving force behind this. Then, of course, the war came, and uh, our involvement in the war, the the dam became federalized, and most of the output at that point went to the uh, McDonnell Douglas plant in Tulsa at the airport and to the Oklahoma Ordnance Works Authority in Pryor, which is now the Mid-America Industrial Park, mm -hmm. which is our only retail sales area. Hmm. So uh, hmm. we have a long history with uh, all of, of that effort. After the war, then it was turned back to the state in about 1948. And uh, since that time, uh, we've continued to serve 
uh, people originally in the northeast part of the state, but now through our agreements with uh, Oklahoma Municipal Power Authority, with Western Farmers Co-op and many other co-ops that we serve, uh, our power in some form or fashion mm -hmm. goes into 75 of 77 wow. counties. So do you own the transmission lines as well? We do. Now a lot of those, uh, Western Farmers as an example, has a vast transmission system so we have an interconnection with them where we supply them power. Uh, but uh, the cities that we serve on a wholesale basis, uh, Stillwater, Stillwell, Tahlequah, Claremore and many others, uh, we, we deliver the power to them. <clears throat> they have their own power system that delivers it to the end user. Hmm. Are there activities that GRDA is responsible for that do not necessarily directly involve the generation of electricity? Well, we were formed as a reclamation and conservation district. So we have a lot of responsibilities. We maintain the watershed of the Grand River system uh, all the way to the dam at Fort Gibson. Fort Gibson Lake is actually a Corps of Engineers lake, but we have responsibility of the water at, up to that point. So we, uh, we sell water to uh, municipalities, to rural water districts and others, as well as uh, maintain and, and police the lakes uh, and maintain uh, order there. Uh, and one of our uh, things that we're really working on right now is trying to increase the water quality uh, in Grand mm -hmm. Lake in particular. A couple of years ago we had an issue with blue-green algae yeah. and uh, you know, we're doing what we can to try to mitigate that. Uh, Two-thirds of our watershed comes out of Kansas and mm -hmm. a lot of that uh, effort that we're doing right now is to educate people primarily in our uh, up further in our watershed so that they upstream, understand upstream uh, so they know that what they do there in Kansas or wherever it may be has an impact on the the lake itself and, and all those that depend upon it. There was uh, litigation I don't think we need to get into necessarily over in the eastern part of the state, not dealing with you or your watershed, but dealing with uh, what uh, folks who raise chickens and the like uh, put in the streams and how that mm -hmm. affects water quality. That decision is still pending. It hasn't uh, come out yet, but I guess you're watching that case. Well, we are, and that's something I dealt with in the legislature as a representative yeah. from Tulsa. Right. You know, our water supply for the city of Tulsa comes from that, that area as well. Uh, so uh, it's something that we have a lot of interest in. Phosphates and other nutrients that get into the uh, watershed are, are the things that blue-green algae feed on. So that's a, a, a big concern to us to make sure that, that we decrease the loading of those nutrients coming into the watershed. Uh, so that uh, we don't have this abundance of blue-green algae or other issues that create recreational and other problems. Mm -hmm. How does the, the Grand River connect to the Arkansas River, or, or do they? They do. Uh, after uh, the Grand River leaves uh, Fort Gibson, it goes into the Arkansas River system. So uh, the Corps of Engineers helps us manage the flood control mm -hmm. over our facilities, and all of that then leads to uh, the, the way that they manage the, the uh, 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 McClellan Kerr Nav Arkansas right. River navigation system. So they use that water to help maintain the levels needed. Well, you know, you hear people in Tulsa say, you know, the, the Arkansas River used to have more water in it than it <laughs> does now. Why is that? Well, uh, you know, it, certainly uh, in the Arkansas River in Tulsa, it's uh, the Keystone Lake above it uh, is. Uh, manages that flow going through there uh, and uh, they use it for a lot of different reasons mm -hmm. now than just keeping the water in, in the lake. Having dams uh, in that system at, at uh, uh, different places, Jinx and in Tulsa and then mm -hmm. upstream, uh, I think will really help and that, that, that's something that, that we would sure love to see yeah. is water in the river on but, a regular basis. But there's basis. agricultural uses, there's, I mean people are drinking it and I right. assume some of it just escapes you know, through natural uh, causes. You know, that's one of the reasons that Tulsa went to the uh, northeast part of the state to get their water supply because the Arkansas River wasn't the best for drinking water and uh, there's a lot of salt in it and it's uh, a lot of sand as well. 
So, uh, you know, keeping that, the solution to mm -hmm. dilution is pollution. I mean, pardon <laughs> me, the solution to pollution is dilution. Uh -huh. So, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you, you want to be sure to keep the, all those things at a minimum level. And uh, that's, that's one of the things that we're, we're really working on because there's been a lot of discussion in Oklahoma the last several years about water quantity. And I know Oklahoma City, uh, you know, that's a big discussion. Mm -hmm. But what we're very concerned about is water quality and making sure that the water that we do have that's available to our residents is the quality necessary to be able to use for human consumption. Because if you increase the cost to uh, pr prepare it for in the, the end user, then you've raised the cost for everybody. What, uh, uh, to whom do you report? Who's your boss? As CEO of the GRDA, to whom do you answer? Most days it feels like every citizen in Oklahoma. <laughs> uh, but uh, we do have a board of directors. Uh, we have a seven member board. One member represents the municipals uh, that we serve, the, the cities. One represents the co-ops that we serve. Uh, the governor has three appointments. The speaker of the house has one appointment. And the president pro tem of the Senate has one appointment. And those are staggered terms, I guess. They so. are. The, mm -hmm. the two, um, uh, members that represent our customers or there's no term to those those are appointments by their bodies the others have a five-year term so we have one uh, of those five directors going off every year when I'm in Texas and, and visit a lake sometimes I'll see development that goes right down to the shore mm -hmm. and you generally don't see that around Oklahoma lakes why is that well most of the lakes that we have are Corps of Engineer projects and they have a different a type of structure in the way that they manage those. But on Grand Lake, and one of the reasons it's been such a phenomenal success in economic development, is that you can have your own dock associated with your property if you're in a part of the lake that is laid out in a way that can accommodate that. Uh, that's not true in, in the other parts of the state. So mm -hmm. you know, we have you know, probably about a third of the people that come to Grand Lake are from the Oklahoma City and Edmond mm -hmm. and greater Oklahoma City area. Uh, and that's because of that ability to have your own private dock, quick access to the lake so you can go right down and get on your boat and, mm -hmm. and enjoy the, the water. Let's get to a break. Mick Cornett and Kent Myers and our guest today, Dan Sullivan of the Grand River Dam Authority. We'll be right back. People have been talking about energy independence for a long time. It's always been popular, but today it's possible. We have an enormous supply of oil and gas in the United States, much more than we thought just a few years ago. New technology, massive new discoveries, largely made by Oklahoma companies. It literally changes everything. And Oklahoma is leading the charge. Go watch this video to see why. Energy independence starts with us. The good life comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First. Loyal to Oklahoma. Loyal to you. back on the set of The Verdict, visiting with Dan Sullivan of the Grand River Dam Authority. You know, it, it occurs to me and when a lot of western states around the, the country are, are just clamoring for more and more water, 
we're better off than most. And certainly Western Oklahoma has been dry because of, of, of the drought. But in, in general, Oklahoma is just better off. And a lot of that has to do with the foresight of the generations that came before us. And so creating this, this dam, creating this lake in 1935, that took some foresight. With 2020 hindsight, look back, did they get everything right? Was this a, a good thing, a bad thing? What would life be like today if they hadn't acted at, at the time? Well, you know, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, you think back and there was a group of people that were called the Rainbow Chasers hmm. that uh, helped uh, create what's now GRDA. Uh, and that was the vision of damming up the Grand River because they saw the real potential for that. Uh, the interesting story about that is that the city of Veneta, where our headquarters is, uh, passed an ordinance saying that any train coming through the city bearing the president had to stop. <laughs> so uh, uh, President Roosevelt heard of this, and he'd been down in Texas and was going traveling back east, came through Veneta, and they stopped his train. <laughs> <laughs> now, they'd all be in jail today if they did that, but uh, they stopped the train, they, they got on and told him their story, and as a result of that, the federal funds necessary to build the dam, about $25 million huh. at the time. This was wow. Roosevelt? The President Theodore Roosevelt? Roosevelt? Uh, no, well, no. Uh, Franklin. Franklin. Franklin Roosevelt. Franklin okay. Roosevelt. So this, is, this was in the 1935, 36 Oh, so right in that frame. era, yeah. yeah. So the, the state had created the Grand River Dam Authority, but they didn't have the money to build the, the dam. It became the Federal Power Administration project. And, uh, you know, things were done in a way then that they couldn't be done today. You know, building a, a one mile dam, which is the size of our Pensacola dam structure, uh, would virtually be impossible today with all of the uh, regulations and all of the, the uh, environmental issues associated with large construction projects. and. Uh, just condemning the land itself, it would be uh, very difficult to do. So I agree, I mean, the foresight of the people to build that structure to create the hydroelectric facility that would literally electrify that part of the state was very, uh, very insightful and uh, mm -hmm. very visionary. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we wish we'd see more of that today, uh, but you know, frankly, it, it's, a, it's a real problem to be able to do that. But we are now the beneficiaries of that. We're now 75 years into this project. Uh, this year we'll celebrate the 75th anniversary of the opening of the, uh, the, the dam and the completion of it. And as a result of that, the economic development, the economic growth that's associated with just the lake itself is tremendous. Uh, you, know, you go out on the 4th of July and, there are, and it's about the third or fourth largest city in the state on any large holiday like that because of the yeah. number of people that are out on that lake enjoying it and, and, and uh, taking their families and, and spending their dollars and uh, uh, enjoying the, the, all the amenities mm -hmm. that we have. So you know, we have that plus you know, all the economic development that's been associated with the other power that we generate and the communities that we serve. And Mary, you'll appreciate this. You know, as a municipality, you have very limited resources for revenue, mm -hmm. sales tax primarily being the, the number one. Well, cities that have their own municipal power authorities mm -hmm. have another revenue stream mm -hmm. uh, that is generated by their power sales that's not available to, uh, to many others. So we provide that opportunity uh, and other uh, electric providers in Oklahoma have gotten out of that business because they want to do solely the retail sales and not the wholesale, and that's that's a big difference. Mm. In, yeah, in, I, I think the city the of purpose. Edmond has its own. Uh, they do re resells the, the the electricity and uh, Stillwater is yeah. one of our mm -hmm. main customers as well. And so, if it was originally created for electricity, was it also created for water? Was it created for both, or did water come? Well, I mean, well, drinking water is what I'm sure. I'm well, at. I mean, at the time, uh, many uh, cities across the state, or at least across that part of the state, already had rights to water out of the Grand River uh, mm. to draw. So city of Grove, city of Wagner where I grew up, and you know, other cities around the, that part of the state had those water rights. Uh, so we, uh, of course, those, those were all grandfathered and there's been litigation 
associated with that, as you can imagine, over the years. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, we continue to, to mm -hmm. serve them, and they, they, ha they use those water rights. When, when you say, though, you deal with 75 of the 77 counties, how is that possible? How, are you, you involved in electricity to the far southwest Oklahoma? Well, through our sales to uh, the, the uh, Western Farmers Co-op, yep. they, mm -hmm. they cover a huge swath of the state of Oklahoma. And beyond. And beyond. Oh, and, really? and in New Mexico. And, and they serve many smaller co-ops that are only transmission co-ops. They're not generation and transmission co-op. Western Farmers own some of their own uh, generation facilities as well. So we don't supply all of their needs, but we right. supply a portion of it. Your office was kind enough to use a phrase when we were discussing your show that I didn't understand, but I saved it for now so okay. I could ask you about it. But the, uh, your office used a phrase, diversified generation portfolio, that you have a diversified generation portfolio. Can you explain that to us? Sure. You know, we, we started out and our initial mission was the uh, hydroelectric generation. Yeah. Which is what I thought that was all you did. And, and that's what most people think. Uh, but in the 70s, uh, we started the process of building two coal plants that are near Shoto, Oklahoma on F Highway 412. Coal-fired electric generation plant. Yes, sir. So okay. we have about a thousand megawatt uh, plant there uh, that's at the, it would be the southeast corner of the Mid-American Industrial Park. Right. So uh, those those were built at a time when the the federal government's policy was you can only use coal to generate electricity. There's not enough natural gas to do that <laughs> in, the, in the 70s and early 80s. Uh, so uh, we have those two plants. We have three hydroelectric facilities. Uh, we have an ownership interest in the Redbud plant that's operated by OG&E and Luther, you can see from the turnpike. And uh, then we have some uh, wind uh, contracts where we buy the output. Now is Redbud coal? Uh, it, that, that is natural gas. Natural gas, okay. Uh, and then we broke ground on the 23rd of January uh, for a new natural gas facility that we're building on the same property as our coal plants that will be a, a basically a 500 megawatt natural gas combined cycle plant that will be state-of-the-art mm -hmm. and very efficient, probably the most efficient unit of its kind in the Western Hemisphere when it's built. So you have many activities that don't necessarily directly involve the water in Grand River. Well, that's true. Uh, our license from FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, to operate those hydroelectric facilities carries with it the obligations to manage the lake, to manage right. the entire shoreline of the lake. We have to file shoreline <coughs> management plans. All of our wildlife mitigation associated with uh, the operation of those lakes are part of our FERC license. So you can't tease the two apart uh -huh. because they're all integrated into that system. Well, how do you interact with OG&E, in, which is you know, based in Oklahoma City? Uh, they've been a great partner for us. Uh, as I said, we, we are a co-owner uh, of uh, the Redbud plant. They've been wonderful folks to work with. They do a good job of operating it. Mm -hmm. It's their personnel that operate that facility. And, and they're set up as a public company. You can buy stock in OG&E. Then that's, that's a different setup from what you we, have. We call those IOUs, investor-owned utilities. And we are a customer-owned utility. Our customers, the people that we sell our power to, really own us. Uh, it, we're a state agency but all we don't receive any revenues we don't receive any appropriations from the state of oklahoma you won't see an appropriation mm -hmm. bill with grda in it really? because mm -hmm. we do not receive a dime uh, from the state mm -hmm. now we pay the state a lot of money we last year we spent about 20 million dollars in services and things that we pay to the state but we live off our own revenues and we're cost of service to those customers so uh, what it costs us to generate that electricity is what we charge our customers. All right. Dan Sullivan's our guest today on The Verdict. Dan, thanks so much for coming on and enlightening us on the Grand River Dam Authority. Well, thank you. I really I, do appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Kent and I'll have a final word when we get back. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, 
Each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. You will always be mom and dad to me. I really think people are so unaware of the number of kids waiting just in Oklahoma. And I think if more people knew that those children were out there waiting, you know, I think that just by the way we live our lives and the people we talk to, that, that maybe we can help encourage adoption from Oklahoma. You will always be mom and dad to me. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record. Since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. And for almost 30 years, Oklahoma political, government, and business leaders have turned to the McCarville Report for accurate, reliable, inside information. Visit the McCarville Report online. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. We are wrapping up a show with Dan Sullivan, who's with the Grand River Dam Authority. Now, let me see if I get this straight. The city of Veneta has this ordinance in, their, in 1932 or so, or 33, All right. that if any train comes through their town with a president aboard, it is ordered to stop. It yeah. stops, they get aboard, and they preach to, to Franklin Roosevelt how they need money to build a dam. Yeah. Or to, to solve their water and electricity needs. I have obviously only seen Franklin Roosevelt in film, <laughs> uh, but I can just see him throwing his head back with that <laughs> pipe in his mouth and laughing when the, these people from Vanita have stopped his train and are going to try to sell him a dam. <laughs> and then think how quickly they worked. I mean, if that's 1935 and by 1940 the dams, I mean, today yeah. it takes 20 years for, a, for an idea at the federal level it'd to be, have an idea to, to opening. It'd take 20 um, years to stop the train. Yeah. <laughs> it was uh, amazing work and amazing story. Dan Sullivan was a great guest. And if, if you'd like more information about Dan and his organization, you can get it on the Internet at their website, grda.com. That's grda.com. And we have a website. We'd love for you to check it out and tell us about a guest that you'd like to see or a subject that you'd like to see us discuss. But that's going to do it for this week's show. I'm Mick Cornett along with Kent Myers, and we'll see you next week on The Verdict.